Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm talking about the books that I read in the first half of January. Okay, I am making this video like a day earlier than I usually would, but I've read a lot of books in the first half of the month, so I really feel okay about doing it. And I, I've got to tell you, as much as I've read a lot of things in the first half of January, I it's it's been a little rough. I've had more than usual lower rated books that I've read and not a lot of high rated books like not a lot of five stars. I haven't had any of the six stars which is what I give to a favorite of the year. So overall I'm not feeling great about my reading even though I did get through a lot of things and you know I say that but as we go through this as you're gonna see I did read some really good books that I enjoyed quite a lot. I just think I'm feeling well plus it's like January. I don't know about anybody else but I feel like January is always the hardest month of the year for me because it's gloomy and cold and post holidays and uh, like it's just not a great month so um you know and COVID it's it's been yeah between that and then just like reading some books that I really didn't like I'm probably feeling more down about my reading than maybe it's actually been but in in general I have had like an average lower rating in the first half of the month than usual. Okay, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and talk about all the books that I read. If you're new to my mid-month reading check-ins, the way that I do these is I just talk about the books that I've read so far in the order that I read them. At the end of the month, you'll get my full wrap-up with stats and books from lowest rated to highest rated, but for this video's purposes, I'm just talking about them in chronological order. So far this month, I have not DNF'd any books perhaps that was a mistake. Do I wish I had maybe DNF'd a couple things? Possibly, but I, I haven't. I've finished everything. The first book that I read this year was actually thankfully a pretty good one. This was one that I really enjoyed. This is A History of Wild Places by Shea Earnshaw. I had this as one of my Book of the Month Club picks for December, and I ended up listening to this as an audiobook from my library. I really liked this. It's interesting. I had not gotten into Shea Earnshaw's YA books. I tried one of them and ended up DNFing it or didn't finish it because it just wasn't really for me. But the premise of this and the fact that it was an adult book called to me and so I picked it up and this book gave me exactly what I wanted. It's kind of an interesting genre bending book like a quiet mystery thriller with a speculative element to it, like a fantastical element to it. And I I quite liked it. It gave me lots of atmosphere and vibes. It's got kind of a cult aspect to it, which is something I tend to enjoy in books. It follows this woman who is the author of these macabre children's books, a best-selling author who has disappeared. And her parents hire this guy to track her down and try to find her five years after she's disappeared, who has these kind of psychic abilities to touch something and like see where the person was or what they were doing and like uses it to track people. So he follows her to this kind of commune town in the woods and then he goes missing as well. So then we pick up the story several years later following some people living in this commune where things are pretty weird. They're afraid of this thing called the rot, which they don't want to let into the town, and so people aren't allowed to go past the town's boundary, and they don't let new people in because they don't want them to bring it into the town, and they have this uh, kind of authoritarian leader, and it's, it's a really interesting book about kind of cult-like behavior and authoritarian leaders and um, yeah, I don't want to say too much more about it than that, but I really liked it. It's got some interesting twists and turns. There are content warnings on this. It does get dark and violent at times, so if you do need those, feel free to check out my Goodreads review, and my Goodreads is always linked in the video description down below, and that's usually where I put my content warnings in my Goodreads reviews, unless there's something really egregious that I want to talk about, just because they can sometimes get a little bit spoilery. Do you know that there is some discussion around a high-risk childbirth and peril to an infant. So like if that's something that's going to bother you, that's in here. But yeah, I really like this lot. I ended up giving it four stars. So that was a nice way to start the year. Then I got to reread one of my favorite books from a couple years ago. This is Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. 
I love this book so much and it was really fun to go back and reread it and remind myself of everything that happened because I have an advanced copy of Fevered Star, which is the next book in the series that I want to read next month, but I, I ne needed to go back and kind of refresh my memory on everything that happened. I had a really good time with this. I love this book. It is very fast paced, especially for an epic fantasy. And I think that's the main critique that I see from people sometimes. People who are big fantasy readers sometimes wish that it slowed down and gave more time. But I actually like it. I like the pacing. It's definitely pared down to where you're just getting what you need. And I, I was interested to also reread it because I'd heard people say it like since I had initially read it that they didn't like the ending, that they thought everything happened too quickly. And I can see where they're coming from. But again, I actually liked the way it did the ending. I so yeah, so I get it. Like I know not everybody loved it the way that I did. But I adore this book. I think it's amazing. I love the storytelling, the world, the representation. If you haven't read Black Sun, please, please, please give it a chance. It is pretty intense. It starts off with a bang. It. I, I will say this, like, because I knew what was going to happen in that first scene already, it didn't have the same, like, intensity and shock value that it did on my first read because I was like, oh, what? But this time I was like, oh, right, yeah, this happens. So it is a different experience reading it the second time around. But I just really loved and appreciated all of the characters in this story and thinking a little bit more in depth about the politics of the world that we're introduced to and the class politics. I just I really love this book. I think it's fantastic. And I enjoyed my reread of it. So uh, five stars. <sighs> and this might be the only book that I've given five stars to so far this month. There is one that I'm on the fence about that it's like I'm between a four and a half and a five. So but 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 this is my only true full five star so far this month, which is is low for me. Although I am this year trying to be more careful with my reviews and like really reflect on them because last year I was feeling like maybe sometimes I would bump things up by like a half star and so I'm trying to not do that uh, but th that is leading to fewer five star books. So then I read a book that I was initially really excited about and then ended up uh, it ended up being kind of a mixed bag. This was one I had for review from NetGalley. It's In Every Generation by Kendara Blake. So this is a new YA book set in the world of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So I love the show of Buffy and there were some things about this book that I really liked and I really liked the beginning part of it. It was kind of fun because in the story we're following Willow's daughter and the younger sister of one of the new generation of slayers. And uh, I don't want to say too much about the plot of this, but it introduces some of the OG characters. So we get a lot with Willow and Oz and Spike. And uh, that was really fun. It was really fun to read those characters because the way she wrote them, it feels like she's a fan of the show. It feels like she knows who these characters are and how they would talk. And uh, that that part of it was really fun for me. It ended up dragging a bit. I felt like the new characters were not as exciting or well fleshed out. And there were a lot of scenes that felt kind of repetitive. I did find the scenes surrounding the big bad to be pretty compelling and I enjoyed those. But with all of that, like, here's the thing. There were some choices made in this book that I don't love and I think are worth critiquing. Number one, there's this big plot thread of tension between Willow and Oz of this almost like, will they, won't they get romantic again? And I had seen some other reviewers talk about this, that the, the fact that Willow is like a lesbian icon who very clearly in the show said, no, I'm gay, I'm a lesbian. And then to do that just feels kind of icky. And I, I don't... I like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I feel like that went too far with this fan fiction-y quality in a direction that isn't great. So I wasn't a fan of that. I also, I also felt like the whole setup for why she has a daughter with this like pregnancy she didn't know about or consent to is, is a, a little weird. I don't love that as a choice. I, I feel like we could have found a different way to make it happen. And then the fact that the big bad is all about like virgin blood and it does sort of try to grapple with the, the, the problematic nature of like the concept of virginity, but 
for like a couple of sentences and it never addresses the issue of heteronormative ideas of virginity. So yeah, I just didn't, I didn't love it. And on top of that, I felt like the new characters were kind of bland. As much as I was really, really into the early part of the book and had so much fun with the introduction of these characters who I know and love from the show, I really struggled to get through the rest of this. So for those reasons, I ended up giving this book two stars. Then I did a reread of Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. This is for the year-long read-along that myself and Leanna from Leanna's Library are doing on our channels. So I'm not going to say too much about my reread here. We are doing a live show at the end of the month. We're going to do full discussions of this book, but this was my third time reading this book and it was fun. I had a good time with it and uh, looking forward to discussing it. I gave this book four stars. Then I read my least favorite thing I have read so far this year, my first one star read, and I'm not gonna rehash a lot of this here because I have a full reading vlog where I get into a lot of detail on this, but I read Verity by Colleen Hoover and I hated it. I gave it one star. I will tell you I very rarely give out one stars and I usually reserve them for books that make me actively angry, not just books that I think are bad. And uh, this this was one of them. So yeah, I did not like this book. And one thing that I do want to say here, because I hadn't really heard other people say it is there is a huge content warning in this book for graphic on page abuse of infants and children. There's also like infidelity and ableism and lots of other things. Again, I'm not going to rehash everything here. I will link the vlog project up above if you want to check it out where I read this and another Colleen Hoover book that we'll, we'll talk about. My first time ever reading Colleen Hoover and I have definitely decided she's not the author for me. Her books are very readable so I get why maybe she's so popular. They're very quick and easy to read but I do not like the subject matter or content or way she goes about doing things for the most part. So I do not plan to read anything from her in the future, but I tried. <laughs> then I read Echoes and Empires by Morgan Rhodes. This is a book that I had as a review copy from NetGalley. It's the first book in a new fantasy series from Morgan Rhodes. And I would say that basically this book was fun and pretty competently written, but never in a way that made it stand out. Does that make sense? Um, I didn't have any major problems with this book and I think the concept is a fun one and I had a pretty good time reading it, but also the characters felt kind of like tropey cookie cutters. The plot meandered a little bit more than it needed to and was mostly exactly what I expected from it, with the exception of a twist or two towards the end that I wasn't completely expecting. I do think it's setting us up for potentially an interesting series because as much as I felt very mediocre about the book through most of it, I do think she does a pretty good job of pulling all of these sort of plot threads and political issues and characters and magic and different things together in a way that is interesting and leaves you with a lot of questions for book two in the series and it's clear that it's going to be a series. So I wouldn't call this an amazing start to a series but a promising start where I am curious to see where she goes in book two. It's kind of interesting because she is known for her best-selling fantasy series that are set in a completely different world in more of a low technology time. And this book is very different. In terms of technology and culture, it feels very modern, except for the fact that it's set in a world with magic, or rather in a world where the queen, because we're also in a monarchy, doesn't want magic to exist and is trying to stamp it out and execute people who have it. So yeah, it's interesting. It's somewhat twisty. It's melodramatic. There's lots of like teen angst, but you know, it leaves us in a place that is intriguing for book two in the series. So for all of those reasons, I gave this book three stars. And I really feel like Echoes and Empires is kind of the epitome of a three star read. It very solidly feels good, but not great. That's that's right where I'm sitting with it. Then I read To Sir Philip with Love by Julia Quinn. This is book four or something, four or five, I think, in the Bridgerton series. 
and I, I've got to say this is my least favorite of them all so far. I picked this up after reading Verity because I really needed a palette cleanser. I needed something that was going to be light and fluffy to like get rid of the ick factor of the abuse in that book. And this book did do that for me. I'm just kind of bummed because I love Eloise as a character and I had such high hopes for this. I loved the idea of her having this like writing correspondence with this widow and then like them meeting and falling for each other but Sir Philip is kind of awful and I just really felt like she deserved better. He is pushy and not great with consent and selfish and not a good communicator <laughs> and like he just kind of sucks and I feel like by the end of the book he hasn't actually grown that much. It feels more like Eloise has just sort of minimized herself to fit with his world and yeah, I don't, I didn't, I didn't love it. I did still really love her as a character. I still really loved all of the Bridgerton family interactions that we get. And that's so much of what I read this for. I love the way that she writes their family dynamics. Uh, but yeah, this was my least favorite of the ones that I've read so far. I gave this one two stars. And if they do this on the show, I really hope they make some changes because it it could be so much better. I liked the kids pretty well because he has kids, but he, he I, the romance, like, mm, eh, not great. Next, I read a poetry collection. This is The Kissing of Kissing by Hannah Emerson. This was sent to me for a review from Milkweed Editions. I really appreciate the project of what this imprint is trying to do and what this collection is doing. This poetry collection is by a non-speaking autistic artist and poet and Milkweed Editions is trying to do this thing where they publish more literary works by neurodiverse individuals, which I think is fantastic. I think that's a really great project. So I had kind of a mixed experience with this. I loved some of the poems in here and I loved some of the themes of what she was trying to talk about, but I also found a lot of it to be uh, to be a little bit difficult to access for somebody who's not a big poetry reader, which I'm not. And it took me a while to kind of get into like how she does so much word repetition and the structure of some of them. I, like I still don't feel like I really understood some of the poems, but then others I really loved. There's others that I think are doing really powerful things, talking about her experience as a non-speaking autistic person and sometimes being dehumanized by others around her. It's also got these beautiful, hopeful poems about connecting with nature and about humanity, life and fullness. And it, it's it, there's a lot that's really good about this and I would recommend it to people. I would just say go in knowing that some of the poems are more accessible than others to the average reader. I ended up giving this collection three and a half stars. Next I read Servant Mage by Kate Elliott. This was sent to me for review from Tor.com so thank you to them. This is the book that I'm on the fence about whether it's like a four and a half or a five star read for me. I really enjoyed this. I love Kate Elliott's work in general. I think she's such an underrated sci-fi and fantasy author. Author, and this is an interesting book. It's a novella that is basically an epic fantasy story condensed into about 150 pages. And looking at the reviews for it, I think it's very clear that for some people that's a positive and for some people that is a big negative. There are some fantasy readers who are like, I do not want short form epic fantasy. I wish this was a full length novel. And while I kind of understand that, I actually really like what she's done here. I think it's really impressive that she was able to condense this level of world building and character development and plot into just 150 pages. I will say that the main character who feels well developed is our POV character. It's told from the perspective of a young woman named Felian who is a lamplighter. She's a servant mage, which means she's kind of part of an enslaved magical class of people who must serve other people with her magic. And she ends up getting pulled into conspiracies and politics that she didn't expect to, I think is the best way of saying this. You know, the more I'm talking about this, I think maybe this really is a five star read for me. I, I, I've been like back and forth on it. 
but I loved what this was doing. It's subverting common tropes in fantasy with the way that it ends and the way that everything wraps up. And it's setting the stage of this really fascinating world. Honestly, I do hope that she writes more in this world because it's an interesting one. And I would love to see some full length novels come out of it. That said, I think this book is doing what it needs to do. And while it's maybe not fully fleshing out all of the supporting cast, we do learn a lot about Thelian and I think we get a really good character development arc with her. And I will say this is also almost like a slice of life version of an epic fantasy, which is part of how she's able to achieve this, is it's like a couple weeks maybe in the life of this character. I loved it. I loved what it was doing conceptually. I thought the world building was incredible. I had a good time with it. I liked the story. Again though, if you're going into this and you're expecting something that isn't an epic fantasy story, or if you're the kind of fantasy reader who really needs your epic fantasy to be full-length novels, this might be less for you, but I was a fan of it, and it, it is. It's right in that like four and a half to five star range. I'll, I'll give it some thought and decide before the end of the month for sure what it's going to be, but I really liked it a lot. Then I finally finished reading The Starless Crown by James Rollins. I started this last month and kind of put it down for a while and eventually finally came back to it. And I think this is a really interesting book. This is James Rollins' return to fantasy. He is well known as a best-selling thriller writer, but apparently he early on did write fantasy and is now kind of going back to that. And on an epic scale, this book is about 550 pages long. So this is an interesting one because there's a lot that I really liked about it. And in the first hundred pages of it or so, I was thinking, this could be a new fave. Like this could end up being one of my favorite fantasy books of the year. It had that potential because I really liked the world it was creating. It's a really interesting sci fantasy novel. It's a fully fleshed out world that he's created, including with creatures, which is interesting because James Rollins is a practicing veterinarian. And so I think you kind of see that love of nature and animals coming through in the crafting of these interesting creatures for the world. I really liked a lot of the characters. I liked a lot of the basic ideas. I liked the plot. I think there is the potential for this book to have been a favorite, but I, I have a couple of quibbles with it. The main one though is I just think it's too long. I think from the middle all the way through the end it kind of drags. It gets very repetitive. It's a multi POV book. It follows multiple characters and throughout much of this book it's basically them traveling and fighting and it just was not that interesting. It got repetitive and it felt a little bit to me at times like the author had spent so long creating this world and coming up with all of these ideas for different creatures and ideas for different places in the world that he wanted to throw all of that into the book and make scenes in all of those places and, you know, that's maybe fun for the creator, but like as a reader, I'm like, okay, this isn't actually progressing the characters forward. It felt like we went from a book that had really interesting character development and growth arcs to a book that kind of put the characters on the back burner in lieu of showing us more places and things in the world and doing a lot of fighting scenes. So I didn't love that. This has the bones of something really amazing, but it kind of lost me towards the middle and end of the book. This is the first book in a series and I would maybe be interested in seeing where it goes. I would probably wait and see what reviews of book two look like before I pick it up for sure, just because like if it was pared down a bit, I would be into it. But if it's again going to be like 550 pages with a big chunk of that just being characters like traveling around and fighting each other, mm, I'm, I'm less interested. One other thing worth noting about this book with, that I didn't necessarily love, although it didn't affect my rating of it, is it does do this trope that I wish we could just retire of having magical healing for a disabled character. And I just wish it wouldn't do that because I kind of think it's disappointing and unfortunate and a bit of a lost opportunity. One of the most interesting characters in this book is a blind teen girl and, you know, because of reasons, she is no longer blind, not too far into the book. And 
I, I just don't think that needed to happen. I actually think that this book would have been much more interesting and also had more added tension keeping her as a blind character doing all of the things that she does throughout this book. So it feels like a lost opportunity and also just an ableist trope that I don't think we need to keep doing in literature. So I didn't love that. Again, it didn't really affect my rating, but I think it's worth pointing out. Ultimately, I ended up giving this book four stars. There was still a lot that I liked about it, and I think it's an interesting world. I think it's an interesting start to a series, but it feels very self-indulgent in not cutting some of the scenes in the later part of the book. So four stars. Next, I read Here to Stay by Adriana Herrera. This is another one that I had as an audiobook, so I, I listened to it that way. This is a contemporary romance from an author who I know I like. I feel like she's kind of become a go-to for me because I just... I know what I'm gonna get with her books and I know they're always gonna be a pretty good time. This is the first book in a series set in Dallas and this one is following a Dominican woman who is a transplant from New York City to Dallas and she's a social worker running the nonprofit arm of this big corporation that helps provide necessary services to kids, especially children of undocumented immigrants and just does really great work. The conflict, of course, is that the company that funds her job is planning to go public, and the siblings who own the company are split on whether or not they want to keep the social justice arms of the business. So they've brought in this guy who is another New Yorker, who is a consultant who's supposed to give his recommendation on what he thinks they should do before going public. And of course, he is our hero. I really enjoyed the romance between the two of them. I thought it was great. I liked the larger issues that Adriana Herrera addresses. I always like the way she does that. She blends like social issues in with these super steamy romances and this like it's very steamy. It's done quite well. And I just really liked the two of them together. This is also a book that I would say has good fat representation if you're looking for that in your romance. It's not a huge part of the story, but we do have a plus size heroine and I liked the way that that was done. Overall, I thought this was a great book and I gave it four and a half stars. Then I had been reading a lot of fantasy. Like it's been a lot of fantasy this month and I, I needed some palette cleansers. I was like, I need to read something that's not fantasy. So I took a look at my classics TBR for the year and decided to pick up a short book on that list. I read We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. This is my first Shirley Jackson novel, which I'm really happy to finally be reading something from her. I've been meaning to read from her for a while. And this was such an interesting little novel. I kind of loved it. It's all told from the perspective of this young woman who we're told is 18, but her voice feels more like a 12 year old and that's clearly intended to be on purpose. She lives in this estate with her older sister and her disabled uncle after most of their family died through poisoning. Her sister was accused of their murders but ended up being acquitted and now they all live together. And it's this very strange little book about neuroses, about toxic small town dynamics, and I, I was really into it. I liked it a lot. I think if this is a, an example of the kind of work that Shirley Jackson does, I feel like I'm going to be really into her stuff. It's this like psychological slow burn horror. And in this case, it's also darkly comedic. It's like creepy and funny at the same time, which is an interesting balance to strike. And I, I loved it. I thought it was so fascinating and I liked the way it was executed. So yeah, not necessarily for everybody. I think if you're going into this expecting it to be something super scary, you're not gonna get that. This is literary horror that has like a dark comedy side to it and it's kind of quirky, but I was, I was really into it. I ended up giving this one four and a half stars. If this seems like a lot of books for the first half of the month, I guess I should tell you I read like 18 I think. I think I've read 18 things so far. Some of them are like poetry collections though and a lot of them were audiobooks but it is a lot. This is what I meant when I said I've read a lot of books um, but we're getting there. Next up I read Guns of the Dawn by Adrian Tchaikovsky. This was Liana's pick for the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club and so we're gonna be over on her channel at the end of the month discussing this. By the way, Blades and Bodice Rippers Book Club is going quarterly for 2022, so our next book is going to be in April, and if you're interested in finding out what it is, it should be announced 
at the live show for this, so stay tuned. I'm not 100% sure what it's even going to be yet. But Guns of the Dawn is an example of flintlock fantasy. So it's set in a slightly magical world, but with early technology, sort of where they're using where they're using like muskets and flintlock guns and stuff like that. So I, I know Leanna really loves this book. I feel like it's going to be an interesting conversation at the end of the month. I had kind of mixed feelings about it. I really liked the project of the book and I liked some of how it did it, but not all of it was totally my cup of tea. This is military fantasy, so a lot of it is set surrounding this war. But because the magic in this book is pretty minimal and kind of off to the side, it mostly reads like a historical fiction novel. That's that's kind of more what it reads like. The project of this book is to depict a woman going to war in a historical time period, which I just think is an interesting project. So our main character in this book, written by a guy, is a woman who ends up being drafted into the military. And kind of her experiences there and her experiences being part of the war. Because she is our only perspective character, the view of what's happening is pretty narrow. Like we really only learn about things that she would experience herself. And when we get peeks into the wider world, it's it's brief. And so uh, I really liked her as a character. I liked the project of this book. And I think this book for me was at its best in scenes that were focused more on developing the politics and on building out the characters and their relationships with each other. With the exception of the romance, there is a romance subplot that I did not care for. Uh, I don't know if I'm in the minority on that, maybe, but I didn't really care for the romance subplot in this. I kind of done without it. But I think for me, this book was really at its best when it was doing like political machination stuff or doing non-romantic character development and relationships. A lot of it, though, was military stuff that I just don't find that interesting. And so I ended up finding parts of this kind of dull and repetitive. And I also, like I said, did not like the romance. And I, I see the purpose that that relationship served for parts of the plot, but I don't think it needed to end up being really a romance. Like I didn't, I didn't like feel any of the passion or emotion there. I, don't, I didn't, I didn't care for it. So uh, for me, this ended up being a three and a half star read. I still liked it. I liked parts of it. And I think it's an interesting book. And I can see why other people would really love it. I think if you're really into military fantasy, definitely give it a try because it's an interesting version of that. But as somebody who's picky about even liking military fantasy in the first place, and who was, we'll say underwhelmed by the romantic subplots uh liked but didn't love so three and a half stars then i read that other colleen hoover book it ends with us i'm not going to say too much about this again because i have that whole reading vlog where i go into more detail with my thoughts on this but i ended up giving this book two and a half stars this is a book where even though there are things i dislike about it i can see some value to it what i think this book does well is gets in the mindset of a woman who is in a physically abusive relationship and kind of unpacking the reasons that she might stay in that relationship and the rationalizations and justifications she might give to herself while in it. And it also deals with, for somebody who finally does leave that relationship, this idea that it's like a death, that you're grieving the loss of this person who you love or, you know, who you thought they were or the parts of them you still love. So those are the things that I think this book does well. There are other things that I was much less a fan of. And again, I just really don't think she's the author for me, but I ended up giving this one two and a half stars. If you want to hear more, go check out that reading vlog. Then I listened to a short audiobook that's kind of a biography, like a, you, you'll, you'll see, it's an interesting, an interesting book. It's called Star Child, a biographical constellation of Octavia Estelle Butler by Evie's Boy. So this was really interesting. I had the audiobook of this for review from the Penguin Random House Volumes app, and I liked this as a concept. It's a biographical book written for a middle grade audience that blends poetry, biographical prose, and quotations from Octavia E. Butler herself. 
talking about her life and her works and her writing. A lot of it I thought was really interesting and beautiful. I liked what it was doing. I think if you're a fan of Octavia Butler, it does give you a little more insight into who she was and the experiences she had, the sort of social milieu she was raised in, which which is interesting and how that influenced her work, and also how some of her experiences maybe influenced some things you see in some of her books. It doesn't go into a lot of great detail. Again, it's a pretty short book. It's written for a middle grade audience. And I have seen some people say that they don't really love the poetry or don't totally get it. On the other hand, I've seen reviews from teachers of kids who say that it's great as an instructional text because the the poems are in different forms of poetry that you would be teaching to kids that age and so it gives them like a practical example of different forms of poetry. So I think for didactic reasons it was probably done that way um, for, for the audience. All of that to say I liked this quite a bit and I gave it four stars. Then I read a book that might be the most fun I've had with something all month even though it wasn't perfect. I just like enjoyed the heck out of this. I read The Bone Spindle by Leslie Vetter and I had a audio review copy of this from the Penguin Random House Volumes app as well as an eARC from NetGalley so I kind of did a blended read on this one. I thought the audiobook was done really well but this was just so much fun. This is exactly what I want from a rompy YA fantasy. I, I had a really good time with it. It's a debut novel and I do think you can kind of tell that it's a debut. There are places where the transitions are a little bit messy, not as smooth as they could be, and sometimes the jumping between present and flashbacks is, again isn't as smooth as it could be, so like there's room for improvement, but I think it's a very very strong debut and I had so much fun with it I kind of didn't care about the technical issues. So The Bone Spindle is kind of like Indiana Jones meets a gender-bent Sleeping Beauty retelling. It's really really fun. It's got that kind of like campy solve the puzzle treasure hunter vibe that you would get from Indiana Jones but it's also set in a world where there is a Sleeping Beauty myth where Briar Rose was a prince who was cursed by a witch. And the two main characters in our story are girls who are treasure hunters who end up teaming up to try to find him and I love them. They have this amazing friendship. It's got this great female friendship at the center of it and they're kind of opposites. One of them is kind of introverted and bookish. One of them is more like the warrior who wields an axe and is, has run away from the kingdom where she was supposed to be the heir to the throne because she didn't want an arranged marriage. And they're great. They're great. And then they each have their own individual romantic side plots that are also fabulous that I had a great time with. So our axe wielding lady is very intrigued by this woman in red who she keeps seeing different places she goes and she develops a, a definite thing for her. Whereas our bookish introverted girl ends up awakening the spirit of the this prince that they're trying to find who's a light magician and so they develop a little romance between the two of them as time goes on. Yeah this was great. It was like a rollicking good time. I loved the characters. I loved the world. I had fun with the plot and it leaves at an ending definitely setting up for book two where things might get a bit darker or like I wonder where they could go. So I had a really great time with this. I think it's going to be a real crowd pleaser and if you're looking for that kind of book I would recommend checking this one out. I ended up giving this book four and a half stars. Two more to go. We are almost there. First up I read another poetry collection. This one was on audio read by the author and I had it for review from the publisher. This is Little Big Bully by Hyde E. Erdrich. She's an indigenous poet and I thought this was a really fantastic collection that is well worth your time if you can get your hands on it. She pretty powerfully talks about the physical and cultural genocide of indigenous people. She deals with cultural appropriation, including of non-native people who sort of claim, oh my great-grandmother was indigenous and want to like co-opt some of their culture without experiencing the pain and oppression that indigenous people actually face. She talks about that. She also talks a lot about things relevant to the Me Too movement and specifically about the experiences of many indigenous women who are victimized repeatedly throughout their lives. She talks about missing and murdered indigenous women, about identity, and I just really loved it. I thought it was a fantastic collection. Again, I think poetry is usually pretty short to get through. It's not something I've picked up a lot in the past, but I've been trying to read a little bit more of it, and I think this one is worth your time. I gave it four and a half stars. Final book that I finished in the first half of the month honestly is kind of a disappointment. 
and maybe I shouldn't have gone in with such high expectations, but I bought this because my friend Mara over at Books Like Whoa was raving about it and comparing it to one of my favorite romances from a couple years ago. And so I was like, oh, yes. And I see the comparison. Like, I do think there are a lot of similarities on the surface. But unfortunately, while I do think there are some things that this book does really well, it also does some things that personally bother me as a romance reader. And your mileage on this is going to vary. I feel like, especially with romance, we can like very different things or like different things in our romance. And so I don't think this is a bad book by any means. But it didn't totally work for me. And I think it's because of some specific things. So this is The Love Con by Ceresia Glass. And on paper, I was like, oh my god, I'm going to love this book. It's a geeky romance with a plus size heroine that's talking about microaggressions and cosplay. Like, yes, please. Mara had compared this to Spoiler Alert by Olivia Dade. And that book also has some similar things. They also share tropes, even though they're done differently. They're both a mix of friends to lovers and fake dating. Here is the difference for me is one thing that I think this book helped me realize is that I usually am not a fan of childhood friends to lovers. I, I, I like a friends to lovers trope when a couple became friends as adults and are friends for a little while and then transition to being more than that. But I am often a harder sell on this kind of setup where they met each other as young teenagers and have been friends for many years. Unless it's like a childhood friends to lovers where they were separated for years and are reconnecting, but that's not what's happening here. I think part of the problem with it is, especially when you have one person who for years has had a thing for the other friend but hasn't talked to them about, about it, it feels disingenuous and kind of deceptive to me and I just don't like that. And that's kind of what happens is she is on this reality show for cosplay and asks him to be her fake boyfriend for the final round of it and he agrees but thinks it's like, oh, my chance to finally like get the girl that I could never get. And I just don't really like that. The other thing about this is that the fake dating means that they are explicitly lying to the most important people in their lives. So it's not just on the TV show, but also talking to their parents and best friends. And I just didn't love that so much either. And then one other thing this book does that, again, your your mileage on this is going to vary, but it's not my favorite version of this, is we have this trope of her feeling like because of her body type and size, he wouldn't be attracted to her or like he wouldn't be as into her as his ex-girlfriend who was like straight size and like traditionally thin. And that's just like not the kind of fat representation I prefer to read in my romance. I understand that that is a real lived experience for a lot of people. But for me, I treat romance often as like escapism to a certain extent. And I it's just not my favorite version of it. So what I think the, for me this book did really well was the focus on cosplay, especially the technical side of cosplay. I thought that was really cool. I also loved the way that this dealt with the microaggressions that our main character faces as a fat black woman in that space. It, like, beautiful. It, it did that very, very well. Um, although at times it was quite stressful, I think, to read those pieces of it. But for me, ultimately, the romance just didn't come together in the way that I wanted it to. And for those reasons, I ended up giving this book two and a half stars. That said, you may love it depending on what you do and don't like in your romance. It's really going to vary. Whew, so there you go. Those are all the books that I read in the first half of the month. It's a lot. This might be like the longest mid-month wrap up I've had in a while. Uh, but I'm hoping that the second half of the month is better. I can tell you one thing I've been having a really fun time with is I'm doing a buddy read with Izzy from Happy For Now of House on Earth and Blood by Sarah J Mass. It's a reread for me and I'm having an even better time with it on a reread than I did the first time around. Like I'm enjoying it even more so that's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, like obviously as much as there were some definite misses in the first half of my month, I also had some hits. There were some really good books. But I'm like, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we'll get some more five stars, maybe even some new favorites in the second half of January. We'll see how it goes. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, I'd love to hear how your reading is going so far this month. Are you reading anything? Do you feel like you're making progress? Have you struggled to find new favorites? 
is it just the month? Are we all just like sad because it's January and it's cold and gloomy? I don't know. <laughs> like, Talk to me in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, it helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.